Before we get into dinosaurs proper, we need to spend a little bit of time just talking about evolution so we have a good basis on which to draw it. The importance of dealing with evolution now as opposed to learning it piecemeal in the future is that without a good base to draw on, we won't understand why we see certain elements within dinosaur evolution and we won't understand why things are occurring. So I just want to ba make a, a good background situation where everyone is coming to the table with at least some information about evolution and at least the basic principles uh, that guide us through the evolution of, of especially what we're concerned with vertebrates. So evolution is actually a fairly simple principle. It's theoretically possible that people could have come up with evolution uh, or that the principles that drive evolution fairly early in human history there's probably a good indication that uh, the ideas of evolution were floating around for a long time, but they're not really codified into one coherent idea until about the time of Darwin and Wallace. Darwin and Wallace are both uh, uh, should or both be considered in many ways the father of modern evolutionary theory. Both of them came up with evolution, the, the structures and the functions that, that give rise to evolution at about the same time. In any case, evolution is based on just three principles. Uh, the first one is that uh, reproductive individuals produce more offspring than can survive, which is quite obvious when you deal with, with animals that produce lots of eggs. But even for humans, humans produce a relatively large number of offspring over the course of their lifespan. And to, be, uh, to keep the population stable, you need only have two individuals survive that entire time. The other thing that's important for evolution is that each individual is slightly different from other individuals. And this is, again, quite obvious in humans. It's not as obvious to our eye in things like fish uh, and things like uh, insects. But actually, if you go down and you spend enough time looking at these things very, very closely, you'll see very quickly that there are actually individuals and they are quite different from one another. And then the last thing, and this is something that Darwin struggled with because it was hard for him to understand how uh, the, traits could be inherited and that we now found out were inherited uh, predominantly by the, the genes. Uh, differences between individuals are heritable. So if individuals are just randomly different from one another, that is of no help. There is no heritability associated with that. But if, her if the differences are heritable individual by individual, then should an individual survive better than another one, then that one will pass on more of its genes. So this is a video here and I really encourage you to look at it. This is a really good, uh, straightforward introduction to evolution. It goes through the basic principles of natural selection as we understand them. And it does it in a way that's comical and also entertaining. So I think that if you have the time, I would really recommend jumping down to the video that's shown here in the link. Phylogeny is something we also need to talk about. So if organisms are related to each other, that means that vertebrates inherently are all grouped together by some branch because they all share some common ancestor. And phylogeny is the building of that ancestry, the tree, as it were, uh, back in time. And trees can include both extinct and living animals. Here we have a lot of living members. We have everything sharks, coelacanths, lungfish. We also have a, a one extinct member here, Tiktaalik. And that's a fish that uh, lived many, many millions of years ago and has not seen this the surface of the earth for many, many millions of years. Individuals come from another individual, and so the relatedness of individuals that are close by each other will be higher. For instance, mammals will be look more like lizards and their relatives than, say, mammals look like sharks, right? There are more branching points between mammals and sharks. But I do want to just point out here, and this is something that, that I think is important, if you group things in here and you call some things fish and others not fish, you'll notice that you have some problems. You have to cut certain branches off the tree to do that. So we need to be a little bit careful about how we use names. Homologous organs are organs that are, or homologous structures are structures that are the same uh, between individuals. So here are the arms of a, a human, a cat, a bat, a porpoise, a horse. Now these are all mammals, so this is sort of self-evident, I think, to some degree. Uh, but the, the arms of a human, the arms of a horse, are the same arms that form, are the same structures that form in lizards. Um, they do uh, form in uh, other lobe fin fish, so uh, 
lungfish and coelacanths also have very much the structure of these arms. And the arrangement, at least in vertebrate arms, is, for I should say the lobe fin fish arms, is a one bone plus two bones plus a, long num a lot of small little bones at the end. So there's one bone which connects up into the shoulder. Then there are two bones that allow the arm to actually rotate. So your rotation occurs down at the lower end of your arm. And then there's a bunch of very small bones. And the reason you have a bunch of very small bones at the end of this is because these are modified fish fins. And fish fins are supported by a chain of small bones at the end of the, the uh, fish fin to help provide a flat paddle-like surface. Now in the case of a porpoise, actually they've, they've re-evolved the paddle-like shape, but they've modified it again. Uh, and here they, they've created a, a sort of unusual fin where there's a large number of um, very stiff bones up at the top and then a bunch of little fingery bones at the bottom. But in any case, it still works very well as a, as a fin. Analogous structures are structures that have evolved independently and so do not share a common ancestry. So for instance, the, win the wing of a moth evolved independently of the wing of these three groups, which are the vertebrate lineages which attain flight down below it. And so this is not the same structure. Now, if you look at the three other wings here, we have a pterosaur wing first, a bird wing next, and then a bat wing over here. Remember that the arm construction, the one plus two, plus lots of little bones is still retained and that's homology but the evolution of the the arm into a wing structure is analogous they didn't each evolve the same wing and then modify it they each came to a separate wing uh, differently and that's why you see things like the pterosaur this wing is actually constructed from an enlarged uh, wing finger or sorry ring finger which extends far back on the body the bird wing is much much different it's a reinforced hand up at the top of the wing and then these uh, the, the limbs are very, very elongated uh, limbs of the arm. And the bat is, again, very different. This is actually, many of the fingers have become elongate to provide support and structure for the wing. And then part of the arm is elongated and part of the arm is, is retained as a shorter element. So the tree of life, of course, is ridiculously complex. And actually, the tree of life is an oversimplification of the way that organisms share DNA. In fact, organisms can share DNA laterally, um, and that we're not going to deal with that very much. And that's predominantly because when we deal with vertebrates, we don't have to worry about some of the complexities we see at the very lowest levels. In any case, especially over here, I think that you may get the impression that bacteria are not as diverse as the rest of the lineage, and that is absolutely not the case. Remember, diversity is contained within the bacteria, and then from there we get smaller groupings. The vertebrates, of course, are a very tiny grouping relative to a lot of other things on the, the tree of life. But for the purposes of our, our talk, the importance of looking at the vertebrates is quite obvious. So here we have them pretty well expanded so we can look at them. So if we zoom in, what you'll see is that over here, this is the stuff we really want to deal with, right? Because eventually we want to get to dinosaurs. And what I want you to see here is, notice how birds here are shaded in a sort of light brown, adjacent to the mammals I know that are in a brown, so it's not ideal. But in any case, notice how the birds here are shown in a light brown color. And then the reptiles are shown in a green color. But the birds appear inside of a green color. So it makes no sense to say of birds, well, they're not reptiles. No, no, they get to be reptiles. They appear in the green lineage, right? But they are a modified reptile. It's okay to give them higher classification or higher number of names to, to separate them out from other groups. We can't remove from them components that they're already related within. That's like saying, well, because you have a brother who was born eight years after you, he no longer is called your brother. He is called uh, something completely different and therefore is not part of your family in the same way. And that's absolutely not the case. Birds are, are a group of reptiles, right? And you can see that here. And I, what I liked about this uh, particular diagram is that you can see that most lineages of dinosaurs, pterosaurs are actually not dinosaurs and they're not shown that way on this uh, diagram. I just want you to be aware they are closely related but they're not dinosaurs. Uh, but the dinosaur, the, most of the dinosaur lineages go extinct at the KT boundary. But birds actually did uh, fairly well and a number of branches actually came through the KT event. And then of course mammals are the real inheritors of the advantage of the extinction and they expand immediately after the KT event to fill up the world in the way that we see it today, right, with the diversity of mammal life that we're accustomed to, but that hasn't been the case for very long. 
So phylogeny really is a study of the evolutionary history of organisms. Now I do want to remind you that we are scientists. We're not uh, able to go back in time and examine these things in a perfect manner. We are only able to understand them uh, through starts and stops, right? And so all trees that we look at are inherently wrong at some level. Some are more wrong than other ho others, however. So we really want to focus on good trees, the ones that are the most right. But trees will change in the future. But what you'll tend to see is as trees, as we gain more more and more knowledge, trees will tend to change just at the branch tips and not at the base. And that is probably true for a lot of the groups that we're going to look at throughout the rest of the course. We have a really good understanding now about how they fit within the, the, the uh, trunk of the tree. We have a less uh, precise understanding of how they fit at the very ends of the tree. And of course that also makes sense to understand exactly how they fit at the ends of the tree requires the most information and so is the most difficult to reconstruct. And humans are actually very good at already building trees. Uh, we tend to place things together that share characteristics, and that is exactly how we're going to go about figuring out how things are related to one another. In the past, we've had to rely on what we call morphological characteristics, so things we can actually physically see on the body and measure. Today, we can use things including genetics to try to examine those at the same time. Morphological features are not somehow a lesser form of uh, knowledge. They are one form of knowledge. They point us in one direction. Genetics is another form of knowledge, which helps point us, uh, hopefully, in the same direction if our morphological traits are good. If we're not good at it, though, what will happen is that we'll have disagreement between the two. And at that point, then it really does become very interesting. We have to figure out what one is telling us or maybe not telling us and what the other is telling us, or again, maybe not telling us. So there's a lot of important information that goes on to understanding just how trees are reconstructed and how different components are related to each other. So like I mentioned before, phylogeny is a hierarchy, and if you've taken an early level biology class, of course you would know that as, as well, because you have to have learned some component of this. This is the most classical form of this, which is the kingdom phylum class order family genus species idea that Linnaeus really founded. We have significantly modified this to a degree. Between each one of these groupings, so let's say phylum to class, we now have many rankings um, between them as well to try to help uh, break things up. But that's because we're getting better at saying these are traits that separate this group from this group and these are traits that separate within that group members uh, from different other different members and that seems to work fairly well now I, I will warn you that there is some talk about uh, whether we uh, continue to use the Linnaean system and especially as you get into organisms like fungi there seems to be a struggle to understand how we actually go about using it in many cases but for vertebrates, we're very, very comfortable in the place of the Linnaean system. Here, what we've done is we've placed us a homo species, uh, in this case our own, homo sapiens, within the larger grouping of animals. So, of course, homo sapiens belong to animalia, which are animals, that's their kingdom. They fall into this phylum chordates, right, a group of organisms that have a, a, an ossified backbone. They have within that class, they are class mammalia, of course, and so the mammals that we are all comfortable with and know uh, are an animals that are covered in hair, that produce milk of some kind, often that take care of young, uh, that kind of uh, thing. W underneath that class, so they're within the class of mammals, they belong to an order of primates, right? So we share many characteristics with the primates. These are lots of different things like our grasping fingers, our forward pointed eyes, our, our relatively large brains. And then within that order, we belong to a smaller group of family of hominids. These are the upright primates, right, that stand around, that have that ability to, to look uh, f uh, forward and, and also are very capable of, of walking over long distances. And then finally, we belong to this very modified group of uh, this genus, the homos. These are the truly uh, upright hominids that that have extremely large brains that are primarily concerned with um, uh, with a, or I should say primarily concerned but are very curious animals but that are also uh, very social animals and that use tools frequently uh, to, to create and do things within their environment and I should say the last but not least the species so there were actually many species of homo at some point uh, homo sapiens interacted with multiple species of homo but currently on the surface of the earth there's only one species of homo left as far as we know. 
So what can we actually use? So again, we can use characters, and this is something that I think humans find very attractive. Observable features are certainly characters which we can use to try to understand the relationship to one another. An observable feature might be uh, for mammals. You might say, well, that one has, these animals have hair, and that would certainly work in many cases. Your book goes on to say, or I should say, the book goes on to say that these have to be anatomical, um, but that's really true for paleontologists. For a lot of other groups, we don't use just anatomical things. We can use other things as well. Anything that we can observe can be a character, right? So a behavior, uh, remember, if a behavior isn't, uh, is, is, even if it's learned, if it's taught by a group of members, if it's a heritable behavior, it itself can be understand, understood through a phylogeny. And so a really good example of this would be the evolution of speech in humans. You can build a phylogenetic tree of language in humans, and lo and behold, it seems to agree very closely with the phylogenetic tree for uh, different people groups on the surface of the earth, right? So there's a lot of overlap here. And why is that? Well, language is heritable. Language is variable person by person. Not every person knows every word in every language, and nor will their children know every word in, every, in, that, in that person's um, dictionary. And so we have these very uh, small differences which build up through many, many thousands of generations and cause very large differences at that point between groups. In fact, they can get so large that groups don't even understand each other, even though at some level they share a common root, right? And an example for this for uh, European groups, I think, is, is the Romance languages uh, that are based around some Latin framework. But things like Spanish and French are quite different languages. They share many components. Speakers can understand a degree of what the other uh, is saying, but they are not interchangeable. You can't just speak in Spanish to a French uh, Frenchman and say, ah, he will understand exactly what I'm talking about. He may pick up elements, he may not. And the ones that we like to use, the characters that are most effective for us, are the ones that are unique, that are difficult to evolve, so they're not likely to appear, disappear, and appear again, uh, and that are stable through time. And if they're unique and difficult to evolve frequently, uh, they will be stable through time, although that is not a guarantee. But we want these kind of elements so that it is, it is useful for us when we're dealing with fossils. The evolution, for instance, of uh, a few more scales on the body is relatively simple. Right, that's a simple thing to do. But the evolution of a certain type of scale may be very difficult, and that may be characteristic of a group. Distinguishing at the very highest levels is easy, and what I mean is as you zoom out, it gets easier to say, ah, oh, these are different from one another. But as you get closer and closer and closer to what we'll call ground level, where you're dealing with an individual by individual, of course it gets harder and harder, and that's because there are fewer and fewer differences to draw things apart on. So for instance, you might have to ask yourself, well, how might we distinguish these two animals? And at first glance, right, this is a very simple thing to do. Ah, the one on the left is the fish, and the one on the right is a chimp. Uh, well, but that's not entirely fair. Chimps are belong to a group of lobe fin fish called the Sarcopterygians. The ones on the left belong to the Actinopterygians, which are the ray fin fish. So really, if we use the word fish, we might want to say, well, they're both fish. But what are some differences here? Well, OK, so that, you're going to make me actually list some. Well, that's very simple. Let's name things. Scales. Um, they have these ray fins on the left. They have a, a head without a neck. Uh, they live in waters and use gills. Uh, they are. Um, not endothermic, although tuna are partially endothermic. On the right, what are some things? Uh, they have mammary glands. They are hairy. They live on a terrestrial environment. They are endothermic. Uh, they have long uh, arms and legs. Branching diagrams also show the hierarchies, right? And so this is an important point when we look at cladograms. And these nodes are what we're going to use as the branching point. So all those features that we mentioned just on the prior slide, we can talk about them on these, uh, these branching diagrams. And at every node, we're going to put in a point, and that will be a separation from one group from another. And we can list those, those things which cause those groups to be separated at this point. In many cases, we have lots and lots of time between individual groups that we see. Even when we look at the fossil record, we're not likely to get individuals that are very close to each other in time, and so the nodes still represent a fairly long time between each other. 
But how do we pick uh, just one of these, right? So how do we actually go about picking things that would separate? How do we actually, so how do we pick this tree, I guess, is what we're trying to look at. So how do we know, for instance, that uh, we've created a correct tree? So here's a cat, a dog, and a baboon, and they're all mammals, right? So they all share some relatedness to each other, and you can see that, and I think most people would be very comfortable placing these together in a group. But some must be more closely related to each other. Cats and dogs must be more closely related to each other, or cats and baboons must be more closely related to each other. But you can't have that they all be equally related to each other. This is one way to reconstruct that tree, right? This is one tree that could be generated. You can actually generate a couple of trees from this, uh, from these different uh, species. But how do we know which ones are the best trees to, or th that, are, that are most correct in that way? Why wouldn't this be right, right? Why can't we assume that this, in fact, is the way that this phylogeny is reconstructed? Well, what we depend on is uh, something called parsimony. And parsimony is the explanation with the least number of steps required uh, to explain it. So for instance, uh, if I walk out onto the street and I drop my cell phone as I leave my door, I might come up with a very complicated explanation. Well, I was knocked out and I had temporary memory loss and I can't remember and then somebody robbed my cell phone. Or I might say, oh, I left my house and I know I had my cell phone. I made it to the bus stop without it. The simplest explanation is that I dropped it along my um, along the the trip here, and that is the same thing we're gonna we're gonna use here. So the tree with the fewest number of acquisitions or losses, and you remember, loss of a character trait is also the evolution of a feature, but it's the loss of that feature. Uh, we're gonna rely on trees with the fewest number of these because evolution will, should take the fewest number of steps required. We do test this, in fact, so we can go back in uh, by adding more characters to the tree. And as we add more and more characters, they should reconstruct the same trees, right? But as we add more, we can go about testing it over and over and over again. So modern phylogenies are often built from hundreds of characters reconstructed together. Ultimately, what we really want to deal with in biology is what we call monophyletic groups. And we're going to look at a monophyletic group here. Monophyletic groups are groups which form uh, a true biological definition of, a, of some member, and it consists of an ancestral species and all of its descendants. So in the case of sarcopterygians, which are the lobe fin fish, if we say lobe fin fish belong to sarcopterygians, we must include within that all lobe fin fish. It makes no sense to say, well, this is technically a lobe fin fish, but it's a little bit different within the lobe fin fishes so I don't want to include it within the lobe fin fishes. That's impossible to understand. It is a lobe fin fish at some level. Now there are reconstructions are done and this is why we continue to, to work on trees and try to understand them. But we can reconstruct trees incorrectly. We can end up with things that are polyphyletic well, where we group members together that aren't that closely related. And we can end up more commonly with what we call paraphyletic which is a group that we say, ah now this is a very distinctly different group from this other group. In fact um, it's not. We've separated out the ancestral species from all of its common descendants and so that doesn't make any sense. So what is Aves here? Well, Aves is a very classic example of a paraphyletic group. What we have, of course, is a group of animals called the Archosauria, which uh, we're going to talk about in the future. Uh, but the Archosauria, of course, include uh, the dinosaurs. And then suddenly we get two birds and we say, uh, actually, these are really different, so they no longer fall under that group. And that is being rectified now, right? We know where Aves actually sits, but frequently we separate them out. And that's not a fair thing to do. Aves belongs to this group, and so it should be reflected in that group. We should think of Aves as a very modified type of reptile. Terms that we're going to use in the course, you're going to hear me use the word derived and advanced. A derived advanced here does not reflect some bettering. It's not a better thing. It's not an appreciably uh, uh, increased level of uh, power or anything like that. It's just a trait that is picked up uh, along the way and it helps that organism. 
Now, that organism uh, may or may not uh, be better than its ancestor in any way. It may just be exploiting an entirely different habitat. So don't let the word advanced here uh, come with you with the idea of quality. It has nothing to do with quality. We also use things like primitive and ancestral, and both of these refer to traits that were retained in the common ancestor. So if, for instance, we talk about eyes in humans, eyes are primitive to uh, chordates, right? Chor all chordates have two eyes that sit on the opposite sides of their head, so that's a primitive trait that we contain eyes. If we talked about advanced features in humans, we might talk about hair, right? Not all chordates have hair, only the mammalians do, so it's an advanced trait relative to the most primitive members of the group. The caveat being that these these words, again, have to be rankered to some uh, comparison. So if we say hair, hair can be a primitive condition if we're talking about mammals, but it's an advanced condition if we're talking about all lobe fin fish. Eyes are a primitive condition if we're talking about chordates, but it's an advanced uh, condition if, we're, if we compare our group, say, to sponges, right? Very, very important to remember where we're anchoring. And then the other two things that we're going to use, we're going to use the word synapomorphies, which are shared derived characteristics. So these are characteristics that we share uh, with other members of the groups that we're related to. For, so for instance, uh, all primates have a five-fingered grasping hand. And then plesiomorphies, which are ancestral traits that are not unique to all members. So for instance, uh, in Sarcopterygian gills are a really good example of this. Some members have gills, some do not. So if you have the book, I really encourage you to read it. The book does a good job of walking through this and, and covering it. this material again. This is a really important topic for us to understand. But the uh, material is, is covered, I think, in a way that students can also sit down and struggle with it at their own rate. Sometimes lectures are difficult uh, to do that in. And then next, next lecture will be about the early evolution of vertebrates. So we're really going to see uh, where do vertebrates start? What are the earliest vertebrates look like? And then by the time we get to what you see here as a four-limb vertebrate, how do we actually get to that point?